Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, I was so excited to finally have on the program the world-famous economist, Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey is one of the most amazing intellects I've ever had the privilege to meet, and I've wanted to have him on the program for a long time. I've learned so much from him and been amazed at the breadth of his reading and his ability to to understand a wide variety of concepts, including those from physics. When, when I've given him my own books, he comes back a day later with the most piercing questions. He rose to prominence early on as an economist. In fact, after being at the Harvard Society of Fellows, within three years, he became the youngest tenured professor at Harvard. He moved from Harvard to Columbia, where he became director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and president of the UN Sustainable Network Development Solutions Network. He has advised numerous governments on real world policies to improve uh, uh, their economic environment, to try and address issues of poverty. And he has been, was for 17 years, special advisor to the UN Secretary General. And uh, uh, his relationship with the UN continues in a variety of ways. And that's relatively important because beyond discussing his own background and why he got into economics and economics in general, I wanted to discuss two of the most controversial global conflict problems happening in the world today, the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza, both of which Jeffrey has written eloquently about. And I'm sure that some of the listeners here will disagree profoundly with some of the things he he suggests regarding those conflicts. But his knowledge about the background of those situations is incredibly important. And I, I admit that I agree with the general notion that the only way to end conflicts like this is diplomacy, that military solutions inevitably don't work out, that diplomacy is the way out. And of course, Jeffrey, is being, having been involved deeply with the UN, um, uh, adheres to that notion importantly. Now, not, many people may think that uh, ending the war in Ukraine through diplomatic arrangements with Russia or um, ending the war in, in, in Gaza with diplomatic relations, which may uh, require compromises, for many people, that may seem like surrender one way or another. But in fact, all of these conflicts can only be solved with win-win solutions, and win-win solutions require compromise. I'm sure I'll receive some angry emails for some of the things he, he proposes, but I found it incredibly enlightening to talk to him. And I think we should have these conversations, uh, even especially about topics which some people may disagree about. It's the only way we'll make progress. I think you'll find him, uh, his, the discussion with him, very interesting and informative. He's a lovely human being, and he, and he's incredibly clear and precise in his language. You can watch the podcast ad-free on our Critical Mass Substack site, and if you subscribe to that site, you will support the Origins Project Foundation, which produces this podcast, or you can watch it on our YouTube channel or listen to it on any podcast listening site, no matter how you watch it or listen to it. I hope you enjoy uh, this and are entertained and probably provoked by this conversation about this all-important public policy issue today. With no further ado, Jeffrey Sachs. Well, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, one of my favorite people, and I'm so pleased that we are finally able to come on. I know that your your schedule is incredibly busy and that you had have to head to Washington, and so we have limited time, but I want to spend a little time talking about you, and then I want to I wanna spend time talking about your your uh, some of your recent writing, which will uh, which will, will allow me to get lots of hate mail. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> join the crowd. <laughs> and, and Jeffrey, so you are without a doubt one of the world's most preeminent economists um you 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 were the one of the, i think at the time the youngest tenured professor at harvard uh in 28 you were 28 we've talked about this before we we're both in the society of fellows at harvard you a few years before me and uh i moved from the society to becoming a postdoc and you almost immediately became a tenured professor from your because of your activities and but I want to ask you a question. Why why did you choose economics? I never asked uh, you that. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, I started uh, traveling abroad. My family uh, actually took me on a trip uh, in 1970 to the Soviet Union, so that was very oh. eye opening. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, it was uh, 
to, to see the other the other world. And uh, I, I I met a young man in a lobby of a, a, a hotel in Moscow who became a pen pal uh, in East Berlin, which was also very interesting. So in 1972, when I graduated high school, uh, I went through Checkpoint Charlie uh, in so. Berlin, uh, across the Berlin Wall to visit my pen pal uh, in East Berlin. And interestingly, uh, uh, at the end of the visit, since I had had to change a certain number of dollars per day uh, into the East German special tourist marks at the time that could only be used, uh, redeemed uh, in special shops uh, during this communist period, uh, we went to the shop the last day of my visit and there was nothing I was going to carry in my backpack except some books, of course. And so I uh, loaded up with Marx, uh, historical and dialectical materialism and whatever was on the shelf. And um, of course, uh, it was opened up to this, whoa, this is weird. I never heard about this in high school. Oh. Uh, came back uh, to uh, uh, start uh, college, Harvard College, uh, and um, we were assigned readings uh, for the first week. Uh, so I was assigned on top of what I had just read about historical and dialectical materialism. I was assigned uh, a the book by Joseph Schumpeter, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, which was a a, a great uh, polemical tract written in 1942 by Joseph Schumpeter, who was a Austrian uh, economist and uh, financier who had been uh, uh, finance minister of Austria just after World War I and then came to teach at Harvard. Well, uh, I read that and I read uh, a, another book, uh, The Affluent Society by John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who was also a Harvard professor and uh, very famous uh, yeah. in at those years. And so, uh, Lawrence, by the time I arrived at Harvard, uh, I was uh, just all these ideas uh, floating around. I was amazed, dazzled, and uh, I went to economics uh, at 10, <laughs> economics 10, our introductory lecture, and I was mesmerized. Uh, and so basically, I fell in love with economics uh, right at the very uh, beginning of uh, university studies. That was 52 years ago. I never fell out of love with it, actually. I've, <laughs> I think it was a, a lucky choice for me, but uh, it started then. It started with the question, how does this world work? Why is there an East Germany? Uh, what is socialism? Uh, what is capitalism? Uh, so big questions. Uh, and. Um, more than 50 years later, I'm still trying to find the answers. <laughs> you, you of, all, of, of all the people I know, it seems to me you are one of the people with the most, with the broadest interests and also an intellect that's capable of assimilating material in a wide variety of areas. I'm, I'm, I'm always shocked by that. So I, I wondered whether earlier on, I mean, you must have had so many interests when you're younger. And I know we've talked science. Did you ever consider science or did you ever... Um, I, you know, you, I'm sure you were, I, I think we shared this. I mean, when you were young, you were probably reading everything, right? I, I assume you, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, I kind of assumed I would do something in politics, uh, uh -huh. from high school. My dad, uh, was a constitutional lawyer uh -huh. uh, and labor lawyer. Uh, and so I grew up in a political milieu. Uh, and uh, civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War, uh, the late 1960s. So I liked politics. Uh, in high school, I did a, a, a little project uh, using some journal article to learn how to do, uh, actually was to place the justices of the Michigan Supreme Court on a left right spectrum. So by hand, I did uh, a kind of uh, my first uh, little bit of econometrics. So I love the idea from uh, the first days that you could combine mathematics and politics. That, to my mind, was oh. absolutely fantastic. Uh, my high school science wasn't great. 
if it had been, maybe I would have gone in a different direction. Okay. Uh, so I got to college loving math and loving the idea of politics and oh. being mesmerized about the idea that you could put the two together. Okay, so that's and did you have good math teachers, by the way? Did you? Math I, I had pretty good math teachers in high school, uh, and um, and then uh, always loved math and and uh, and and had uh, good uh, math courses at Harvard, and um, so that was the combo that yeah, was kind of my science. Okay. Uh, it was wow. kind of the uh, science of uh, politics that interested me, and economics was seemed to be really that. And when I first learned macroeconomics uh, again now it's uh, 51 years ago oh my god i love the idea you could turn dials and pull levers and manage an economy you know how cool is that and john maynard keynes uh, who i learned about uh, first uh, in introductory economics said that and then there were systems and equations and oh my god it just seemed like a world a magical world and you still feel that so you don't think it's a dismal science 50 years later <laughs> well it's it, there are parts of it that are very dismal parts of it that are very dumb uh, i'm writing uh, uh, my little polemical tract right now about mm. how to fix some of the basic ideas um so there are parts that that i still love but i love the the inquiry of it uh and i find it still very helpful because the world's diverse we do not share uh, a common understanding in different parts of the world um and i think that the questions that uh, economics raises if if asked properly and viewed properly are helpful to figure out what we're going to do on this planet Okay. Yeah. And I, so I think, I mean, what I've, what, what I hope people will get, and I've always gotten from you is this incredible inquisitiveness, curiosity that uh, asking questions and, and, and exciting and the excitement of learning, of learning in general, which is kind of interesting for someone who's actually involved as you are in the practical world as a, as an economist, you're not just a, you're not a ivory tower scholar. You've been involved intimately in real world problems, which are much it more messy than 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 standard uh, um, uh, academic problems yeah and what what I found uh, a, a couple of things about that uh, one is that if you're trying to solve a real world problem and I got lucky early on in or lucky and I was I wanted to do that but I got lucky in having some uh, opportunities then you find out your your narrow disciplinary knowledge is just not going to help you to succeed uh, enough you know you just need to know things that you weren't taught uh, and so you better find them out and i don't like to be in a room when i don't know uh, at least as much as what other people are talking about about something that i'm supposed to know about so i work hard to try to know anticipate understand and be able to be able to ask questions and and uh not not be a dummy about it so that that is uh that is really um part of it if you're working on real problems you you don't get to choose what you need to know it's all interconnected uh, and yeah. uh, you know and, and and the more that i worked on those the more that i realized you just have to go that way the second thing is it's on the one hand a little frustrating but on the other hand it's a reality i'd say every day i learn something that i say to myself oh my god how did i not realize that or why didn't anybody tell me that <laughs> or how did i not know that fairly basic stuff by the way sure uh, and it's very annoying because i've kind of walked around my whole life a, a, a relative said to me uh, this was literally 52 years ago why do you always have a book in your hand and I, my tendency is always wherever i'm walking i want a book now it can be on the phone on the kindle okay. but 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 i want to read so i've been reading all my life and then i read something every day and saying god how did i not 
know that. That's ridiculous. Uh, and so that that's another piece of this uh, thing, which is it's frustrating, you know, that you <laughs> reach this age. I'd like to be able to say, well, I learned all that I need to know. Now I'm going to tell you or teach you. But but I don't. <laughs> that's well, it's lifelong learning. I think I mean, I, it's interesting you say that because the real world has forced you to learn things you didn't want, didn't think you needed to know or didn't even know you needed to know. It's true, though, in re research. I mean, as a, as a physicist, I, I, I've said on this program and elsewhere, I learned much more physics after my PhD than before. In the process of research, what you learn is what you have to learn in order to solve a problem. And it's maybe nothing that you ever thought you'd have to learn. And you also learn that you don't have to know everything to solve something. Yes, no, that's, that, that's, that's probably true. the hardest problem to overcome. But I always think in physics, there you know there are a few key results or equations. Of course, then applying them uh, requires a, a incredible amount of ingenuity. But um, it seems, of course, harder, but also simpler. And yeah, it is way, simpler. Which I, is that Nate? It's simpler than it's simpler Nate than nature has organized things. Uh, with some grand equations. <laughs> well, that's why I, you know, I keep saying to people, physics is simpler. It is. It's much easier to do physics and deal with things, especially related to human behavior, which is in some ways economics, which is not just, as you point out, just not just mathematics, but politics. You, uh, before we get, I want to talk in the, in, in, for the bulk of this in some re recent forays into politics of yours, which are, which many people may find quite controversial. Um, uh, or disagree with, which is fine. Uh, but before I do, the, the there's two things about your general career that that I want to at least confront you with. One is okay. So you have been involved in real, you know, talk about macroeconomics, and you are Mister Macroeconomics. You've been involved in actually doing what what you learned you could do in class, namely manipulating economies by twisting dials in in Bolivia, Poland, the USSR. You you you've you've been directly involved with those governments, especially as in the case of Poland and USSR as they came out of communism. And by the way, I visited Moscow in 1967, had a very similar experience to you. So I, I won't go oh, into Oh, very good. But, yeah. but, uh, and Bolivia as well. Around the same time, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You and I have had a, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but Bolivia, Poland, USSR, involved in what some people would call shock therapy. I think it's been called shock therapy, dealing with how to, how to, move from 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 that system to capitalism and it's been successful in in a number of cases in vastly reducing inflation bolivia in particular but some people would say it's done that at the expense of many people that that the in the process of course part of this is saying inefficient industries have to be you know have to ultimately go by the wayside if you if you want an efficient economy and that's been useful for the country. But of course, some people who were involved in those inefficient um, industries and then are out on the street uh, uh, suffer. So how would you respond to that? Well, I, th I think the main thing is uh, each uh, historical crisis is distinct. So uh, the, I, I found I, I learned a lot about the media and about uh, <laughs> public public ideas and so forth through these experiences because uh it, nothing is like what's said yeah. partly by by the way by design uh because uh, there there's a great returns in having uh, a narrative be the dominant narrative so our mm -hmm. governments manipulate information or how things are told partly because in a complex world uh things get described in a very simplistic way, uh, necessarily perhaps, but they have nothing to do with, with reality. So Napoleon uh, said that uh, history is a fable that is often told. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's a pretty good definition, which is uh, don't, don't uh, believe the, the simplicities that one hears. But in general, uh, cases like the ones that I've been involved in uh, have uh, had uh, very different uh, economic, political, financial, uh, cultural realities. And uh, they've been complex, but uh, they don't come uh, loosely labeled and they're not single events. So just to uh, give an example, uh, in Bolivia, which was my first uh, foray into this, 
Bolivia had a hyperinflation. It had a hyperinflation, meaning that uh, the inflation rate at the time that I was uh, asked to, for help had been 24,000% over yeah, uh, the previous uh, 12 months. This is a very rare phenomenon. It means a, a collapse of government, which had happened uh, in Bolivia. There had been a dictatorship and then uh, a uh, failed attempt at democratization, and then essentially a dozen governments, coup after coup, a narco state. There were many. It was pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. I arrived when uh, a new government had come in on, a, on an election. But this was very fraught. Uh, but it happens that hyperinflation is a rather specific kind of phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. very rare. But it's like a disease where uh, you know pretty much what the proximate cause is and you know pretty much what the proximate solution is. Um, and that's the most applicable, applicable case of shock therapy, a term that I find stupid and simplistic, <laughs> but frequently used, um, where you can stop the hyperinflation immediately, basically. Um, so it's not a... A, a long a dragged out process. You don't go from 24,000% to 15,000% to 10,000% yeah. to 5,000. Yeah. You go from 24,000% to price stability if you do that right. And that's pretty much known and shown from history. And that interestingly is mostly turning dials actually. Uh, you do that uh, at uh, the finance ministry and the central bank uh, basically. Wow. So I you know, advised a essentially on what to do. They did it. And, um, oh my God, the inflation stopped. And so you watch this. Yeah. You watch this, like, uh, you know, putting two drops of something into the test tube and it changes color and, oh my God, it's just like they said. And so that was, that, that was pretty amazing. Now you, I always said, uh, um, and, and it was this maybe stupid expression, but the thing that I said at the beginning, you know, if you, I said to the government, if you do everything right, if you're bold, if you're brave, mm -hmm. uh, you can turn an impoverished, broken uh, country with a hyperinflation into an impoverished, broken country with stable prices. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, because the idea is that there's a, a symptom, which is a runaway fever or a hyperinflation, but it also has deeper social, geopolitical, uh, political, economic, structural reasons. And you could end the hyperinflation, which you have to do because otherwise it's nuts. But you can end the hyperinflation, but you don't end any of those longer term things. You just have the ability to survive, to start rebuilding the basics of society, of economy, of government and so forth. So you don't get a miracle out of it, but you end the hyperinflation. I, I knew that much. And the, the rest, you know, wasn't in my bailiwick at, at, at that point. There were years and years and years that followed. Um, yeah. Now, by the time, uh, based on that work, I became, you know, known because I was a young economist. And then other governments said, hey, uh, help us do that, uh, you know, cancel our debts or do that. So. I ended up within uh, four years of uh, that gig uh, advising uh, the post-communist uh, transition in Eastern Europe, uh, in Poland in particular. That also had so much context to it uh, that it would take us, I mean, mm -hmm. it's fascinating, but uh, maybe not for every listener, but anyway, it, it would take days to really mm -hmm. describe what it meant for a society that had been behind the Iron Curtain for 45 years, that even beforehand, Poland was a very complicated, new country reborn after uh, World War I because it had been parceled out among the empires uh, from the 1700s to 1919. So this was a very complicated geopolitics. I understood a bit more than I did in 1985 uh, because now I had a broader context. I Okay, I could help you with your hyperinflation. I know about your debt. And I also know a little bit more about the world than I did because of 1985 and, and the State Department and, uh, and uh, 
the Treasury and the White House know me now because of uh, that, so mm -hmm. I can help make some connections. I wrote a plan for them. It was literally a, a, an all-nighter, uh, which was <laughs> one good uh, experience from uh, my Harvard uh, days. It was literally from uh, because one of the leaders of uh, the uh, post-communist movement said, we need a plan. And I said, I'll, I'll go home from Warsaw <laughs> and I'll send you something in a couple of weeks. He said, I need it in the morning. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I need it tomorrow morning. Are you kidding? No, I need it tomorrow morning. So we went to a um, we went to a nursery school that had been converted uh, to be the newsroom for the first post-communist newspaper, the Gazeta Viborcha. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, over the sink was a plank of wood on top of which was an IBM, uh, an, an IBM first generation uh, uh, desktop. And I typed at night from midnight to 6 a.m. the first ever plan to convert a, a socialist economy to a market economy. Um, and I still have that memo because a colleague uh, located it in the rummage a, decade, oh, wow. a couple of decades uh, later. So it, it actually had a lot of clever ideas in it, and it became the basis of Poland's uh, transformation efforts. Then a couple of years later, Oh my God! The, you know, even Gorbachev's team in, it, it said, "Okay, we watched what happened in Poland. It worked pretty well. To help <laughs> us." Now, this was really my first foray into the uh, the core of geopolitics, uh, because even with Poland, it was geopolitics was easy. You're on our side. This is the U.S. So everything I suggested. The, actually, they, the, the White House said, okay, okay. It was weird, but I raised a billion dollars one day for Poland from 9 a.m. in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon because I suggested that Poland needed a billion dollars to stabilize its currency, and the White House approved it within eight hours. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and so when I got to the Soviet case, I didn't realize that... Uh, I was doing economics, uh, but uh, Cheney uh, and uh, Wolfowitz and others uh, in the Bush uh, Defense Department uh, were doing geopolitics of a sort not to my liking, uh, which was they're the enemy. What the hell are you talking about? Uh, you know, reforming them or mm -hmm. restoring them or solving their financial issues. They're the enemy. I didn't understand that uh, for decades afterwards in some sense because i gave good advice but it was uh, rejected out of hand especially a lot of my advice uh, was what i had learned from john maynard keynes which was don't lean on a defeated bankrupt country in in the case that keynes was talking about in 1919 it was the defeated uh, uh german state uh, he said, worse will come back to haunt you, so you should make a financial settlement that is sane, that doesn't lead to a huge backlash. And Keynes famously predicted if we have these war reparations after World War I, which was imposed by the Versailles Treaty, mm -hmm. we'll have the uh, specter of war haunting us soon enough. So my advice was help the Soviet Union bail them out. And the idea of uh, the, the cold warriors who would soon become called the neocons, bail them out. Hell no, we got them just where we want. We won. They're on their knees. Uh, you know, if we can knock them lower, we're going to do that. So this was a, a different experience. And truly, I didn't understand it at the time because I kept saying, you know, I, I gave advice in Poland and within eight hours it was accepted. And yeah. here, Everything I'm saying is rejected, uh, and I don't really understand that. So I took a lot of shit afterwards for uh, things that were the opposite of what I said. Uh, the U.S. government did not really have the great motive to say, you know, Sachs was right, but we were doing something different. Yeah. Uh, so, so I got uh, you know caught in a kind of narrative and. Uh, and, and I would say, by the way, on, on the left, a kind of very naive narrative, uh, blame 
the economics, don't blame the geopolitics. But this was already a geopolitical game mm -hmm. from 1992 onward. And it's the game that we're in right now. And it's a game in the strategic sense that uh, the word game is used. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a game in the sense that we use it in daily life. There's no game about it. People are dying. We have a war raging. But it's about geopolitics. Well, we'll get to geopolitics. We'll get to a few of the recent geopolitics. Thanks. That's an interesting, you know, in a brief time, uh, a summary of what would, I would like to spend hours with you on it sometime. But let me ask, let me ask you the other sort of confront. I don't plan to confront you, but the other yeah, no, no, no. question, yes. uh, which so okay. Uh, the other thing is you've been involved as a as a special advisor of the UN, the Secretary General of the UN, for like twenty years. Yeah. Why the UN? I mean, the UN yeah. seems to me to be fraught with problems, and, it is. and I'm not sure it's the best organization to help. So I've become more de more um, despairing about that over the last, say, five years. And so I want to ask you, what? Why do you have faith in the UN? It's well, it's the best we have. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm a, a big believer that because we're interconnected so profoundly uh, across the world in our fate whether it is uh, environment, climate, nuclear war, pandemic, you name it, you know, national borders are uh, not so meaningful as uh, sometimes we think. But we got organized in a world of nation states, uh, one uh, that was largely built by European imperial powers in the 19th and 20th century. I believe we need global government uh, not as a sole government, obviously, but as a way to solve global problems. Mm -hmm. And this is an idea that is essentially um, one century old. You know, we never had a, we never had global institutions until the middle of the 19th century, uh, starting with the, the telegraph uh, and postal union yeah. uh, and uh, the beginnings of uh, global uh, pandemic preparedness, we'd say now, but it was for infectious disease. Yeah. That was the beginning in the 1850s under European imperial uh, domination and, and control. But even then, that wasn't really a global government in any way. Then after World War I, the idea was to create a League of Nations. And yeah. that uh, got started by the British and the U.S., in 1920, 21, but the U.S. decided not to join. So it was kind of stillborn uh, and it didn't prevent World War II, obviously. Then in the middle of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt, who's my favorite all time president, uh, said we need to try again with another organization. This time uh, it ended uh, not in Geneva, but on the East River, uh, the United Nations. And it was born in 1945. It is only the second attempt in all of human history uh, to have a universal body to address global scale issues. It's filled with problems. And one of the big problems is it was designed uh, in a, a two-tiered way. Five countries uh, were given preeminence uh, that you can't do anything binding without their unanimous agreement. And yeah. uh, that is uh, uh, the US, and it was originally the Soviet Union, China, which was originally uh, the nationalist uh, China, uh, and uh, Britain and France. So five powers, which we now call the P5, or the per permanent five members of uh, the Security Council, can veto anything that is binding and can block any change in the charter itself uh, that is the constitution of the UN. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, it's also a universal body, but it has a single chamber, a little bit like the Senate in that each state in the US gets two votes, mm -hmm. but in the UN, each country gets one vote. And that's true whether you're Nauru which is the smallest population of the 193 with 12,000 people, or uh, China, 
Uh, or now, actually, yeah, I should say up to date, India, India. Uh, which is now the most populous uh, country, both China and India, 1.4 billion people. So uh, they each get one vote. Uh, now, this also has its uh, problem, uh, obviously, in terms of is that the right mode of representation of people around the world? So I've been uh, donating, I'd say, most of my time in the last 25 years to the UN. Yeah. I am uh, fully aware <laughs> of all of the difficulties, uh, contradictions, and so on. But I love the idea that uh, 8 billion people through 193 representative national governments talk to each other at least. Yeah, uh, I, I love the idea of the UN Security Council. And I testified a couple of times in the UN Security Council in the last two years. And I love the idea that in a civilized way, no, uh, no one shooting at each other in the room, uh, you know, except uh, through their verbal statements, they're actually talking. Does it work great? No, obviously it does not work great. Uh, could it be reformed? Absolutely. I'm, Again, we could have days of yeah, discussion days of, of uh, discussion. What, what to do. But what else are we going to do but to try to make it work and to understand that it's only the second attempt in the 300,000 years of our species to actually have global governance? Yeah. And, and OK, well, that's, I suppose, puts it in perspective and explains why it's why maybe new new forms are, are are required at some point but you might say it's like democracy the worst form of government except for all the rest but yeah uh, but uh, it, but it also needs to be fixed uh, and this is part of the job of the 21st century i'm i'm itching to get to recent affairs but i do want i can't resist maybe because of my training with Noam chomsky early on um when you say okay roosevelt i mean w Given the makeup, especially the P5, would you not say that the desire was not to have a world government, but to divvy up the world for for U.S. and and for for major power control, and and the UN was a sort of a legitimizing force to to allow the U.S. to appear to have uh, international goals when really it was trying to control its hegemony. That I, I'm going to be the devil's advocate yeah. and say that. No, I think at the time, Roosevelt, by the way, was really unusual in, in American leaders. He he really was uh, actually an anti-imperialist and he really believed in economic rights uh, and uh, uh, he believed in uh, human rights and he was really a, an extraordinarily decent, unbelievably shrewd and effective uh, and clever politician. Um, so I really like him from everything I've studied over the last 50 years. I like him. Okay. Uh, complicated personality also, by the way, but uh, yeah. I like him a lot. Um, and I don't think that it was uh, it, it was it was not to divvy up the world. He was no no fan of uh, the British Empire, which was the dominant empire uh, up until the end of World War Two. The United States became the dominant empire yeah. afterwards. But yes. at a practical level, uh, it definitely, it was not actually to give control to the five, it was to give control to the one. Yeah. Uh, the, it was, uh, the United States was going to largely run the show. Exactly. But had, yeah. Yes, but it, had it been Roosevelt, uh, it actually would have run the show in a quite decent way. <laughs> uh, it would have decolonized the world, it would have made for good neighbors in Latin America, it would have done things that Roosevelt truly believed in. He submitted in 1944 to the U.S. Congress an economic bill of rights. Uh, his wife, uh, after Roosevelt's death, Eleanor Roosevelt, presided over the uh, promulgation and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human mm -hmm. Rights. That was not a game. Uh, that was not a PR stunt. That was a very deeply moving, important step in our global evolution uh, as uh, humanity to say that there are basic rights for all people as individuals mm -hmm. around the world and their human dignity. Um, so uh, now, has the UN served all these uh, high purposes? Uh, <laughs> not quite, but at the same time, the bodies that have been created by the UN, uh, 
UNESCO for, econ uh, for education, uh, science, and culture, uh, for ITU for international telecommunications, uh, WHO for the World Health Organization, and uh, many, many others are actually led, you know, people say by international bureaucrats, but they're led by people who really believe in the international mission. They're, they're multicultural, multinational, um, and above any other institution I know, they take a global perspective, which is very hard because if you're in the US, you're almost bound, compelled to take a national mm -hmm. perspective. Even if you're in a university, our universities are funded by the Defense Department. They're funded by the State Department. They're funded by government grants. My colleagues are often aghast at what I say yeah. because I don't take the U.S. government line. Uh, partly, I'm not dependent on it, thank God. But, you know, I find in the U.N., the ethos really is different because people come from different countries. Now, the U.S. still, you know, has its uh, hand on things through mm. its share of the budget and so forth. But truly, uh, among all of our imperfect institutions, if you want to hear an international point of view, not just a national government point of view, the U.N. is you're going to hear it much more in the U.N., than typically you'd even hear in an East Coast uh, University of the United States. Okay, absolutely. No doubt about that. The universities are, yeah, are not, yeah. Okay, we won't get into that. But, um, and so this is a great segue because people might imagine based on your comments about Roosevelt and your and the fact that you have been a quote unquote insider in many ways that you hew the insider line. And, it, and we're going to spend the next few minutes and, and not as much, anywhere near as much as I'd like uh, making it clear that you're not. Um, uh, you, we're going to talk about, uh, I, I looked just at random at, at, at nine pieces you've written, and we won't get through all nine, unfortunately, but they deal with Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, the CIA, U.S. foreign policy, it, it, in a way which, in almost every way, um, radically, differs from the party line of what you'd hear in either mainstream media or in um the US government or uh in many other places. So let's let's talk about some things and and as I say people should be prepared for arguments and and discussions that are are going to upset a lot of people, but it's important to have them and I'm 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 always impressed that you're you you have the courage to 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 state them. The first one is a framework one you wrote in November 30th early on uh, relatively early on after October 7th, uh, a framework for peace in Israel and Palestine, where you argued right off that the only way to end this was to was to welcome Palestine as a US, UN member state. This might shock some people, that the, that the first thing you do after what man, many people you what, what many people claim is an unprovoked, uh, or at least certainly a, a an unacceptable and horrific act of terrorism um, to recognize Palestine as a UN member state um, with pre with pre nineteen sixty seven borders and um, and why don't you, why don't you just spend a few minutes talking about that? Yeah, I think that there are uh, two overarching uh, issues I would say about all of my views. Uh, one is that uh, any event is not really an event it's part of a dynamic process okay. uh, so you can never say well things started on october 7 uh, yeah. hamas made an attack or that uh, putin unprovoked uh, attacked ukraine uh, on february 24th 2022 so whenever you see in the media which you see all the time yeah. unprovoked it's yeah. phony. Uh, as a physicist, uh, you would say, uh, you know, the world is uh, governed by dynamical processes. Uh, they can have some uncertainties in them uh, in the wave equation or uh, in, in Newtonian mechanics. Uh, you know, we thought we were able to predict everything about the future from knowing the current state. But uh, in any event, there are dynamics. Uh, yeah. And uh, that is true. So never look at a snapshot. Uh, always look at the dynamics. 
The second thing is uh, there are two versions of the world, if I, <laughs> if I could simplify a little bit. The United States policy truly is that the U.S. should run the show. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually formal doctrine. Uh, if you read formal, boring doctrine, like uh, the security strategy or defense strategy uh, of the United States, uh, or in the academic world, the uh, grand strategy in the international relations literature of the United States is to be the predominant power, or sometimes called the hegemon, or mm -hmm. uh, sometimes called the uh, unipolar country. I really disagree with that philosophically because we are 4.1% of the world population. Who the hell gave 4.1% of the world population the right to run the other 95.9% uh, of the world yeah. population? That's absurd. So these are the two predicates of almost everything I do, which is uh, say, what are the dynamics here? Uh, so how do you uh, help to move a more complex, multidimensional dynamic system, uh, if, if you were, uh, if you want to put it that way? And second, don't take the U.S. line, take a global perspective, uh, take a shared perspective. Um, so when it comes to uh, Israel and Palestine, there are two peoples, millions uh, of each, uh, on uh, a common land. There is a long history of controversy about that going back to the Balfour Declaration. Uh, there are heated ideological arguments uh, on both sides. Uh, there are both sides saying the other doesn't belong here at all. Uh, and uh, this is fraught with uh, all of the, uh, the, the heat, emotion, deep of religious beliefs and many other things that are part of this conflict. But it also has meant perpetual war uh, and uh, perpetual cycles of war. And it has also meant, in my experience, in my view, tremendous suffering of the Palestinian people uh, relative to the suffering of the Israeli Jewish people because Israel, quote, won and it has had the United States at its back, and the Palestinian uh, people have suffered tremendously in this. Since 1967, uh, after the Six-Day War, Israel has occupied the West Bank and Gaza and part of the Golan Heights and so on. And I first went to Israel in 1972 uh, in uh, about the same, it was the same summer vacation uh, after high school that I visited my East German pen pal. And I went to Israel for the first time and I was told a phrase called facts on the ground, uh, that uh, we are going to put settlements into these occupied conquered lands to make facts on the ground so that we'll always control those places. I was kind of innocent then. I didn't really understand the significance of it. But 52 years later, uh, I mean, I came to understand much sooner mm -hmm. than that, that this is going to be uh, a recipe for profound unhappiness, injustice and violence. And it has been. So I believe that those facts on the ground weren't quite so factual or clever. Uh, as they said, there are now hundreds of thousands of uh, Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Seven hundred thousand. Uh, yeah, and uh, depending on where you draw mm -hmm. lines and how you count, a couple hundred thousand in uh, uh, in East Jerusalem, in some sense, or in the environment of East Jerusalem, and another five hundred thousand away from mm. uh, Jerusalem. But and that has created a lot of zealotry uh, as well, because uh, a lot of these settlers have a uh, a religious. Deeply yeah, that's a real, uh, yeah, the messianic yeah, exactly. And so they believe, well, God gave us this land and it's mm -hmm. ours and there's nothing more to say about it. So to my mind, we've got to uh, end this cycle of violence before it ends up killing everybody, including everybody in an escalating global war. And the way to do it is to divide the territory according to international law that has been uh, 
promulgated for the last 57 years since the Six Day War. And by international law, I mean votes of the UN Security Council principally, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that has said we need two states. It should be on the borders of the 4th of June, 1967. And it seems to me that this is uh, the what, what uh, bargaining theory calls uh, the focal point for the bargain. Uh, it's, it's the only one that uh, has a plausibility that can actually reach an outcome short of all out war. Uh, and so there are people who say, well, we should have one state or we should have a binational state or we should have a democratic state. Uh, there are others who say there should be no Israel, wipe it off the map. There are those that say uh, there should be no Palestine, wipe it off the map. I believe that the way to get this uh, cycle of extreme violence and cruelty uh, over is to implement international law. And it's I think it's going to happen, actually, that uh, Palestine will be uh, become the 194th member of the United Nations. The U.S. is going to fight against this. But in the end, I don't think the U.S. can block this from happening. Uh, Israel, of course, is aghast at it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, so what? <laughs> you you know, say Israel is aghast. I think it's important to point out the government of Israel is aghast. Yeah, I'm that's sure, Let me put it I'm that not way. not sure the exactly. public is. is no, I, you're right. I, I agree with you. I agree completely with you. Now, I want to get to... to well, some key points which you make, which I think are interesting, would counter the general narrative. But one point I do want to say, people would counter you say Israel isn't occupying Gaza because Israel removed itself uh, in 2005 or so uh, willingly, and it occupies the Western West Bank, but not Gaza. Would you would you at least agree with that or no? No, not at all. You know, Good. if you uh, uh, if if you have a, a prison uh, and the guards uh, guard. Uh, the inmates going in and out of their cells, but they don't live inside the cells. <laughs> uh, I would say they're still occupying the prison. Okay. Uh, me, and let, so that's what Gaza is. Let me let your resolution, which you rec recommended, it has, has five bits, and I want to go over them briefly. I just wish we had more time. But anyway, the immediate establishment of Palestine is 194th UN member state with the June 4th borders with capital East Jerusalem and control over Islamic holy sites and immediate release of all hostages, permanent ceasefire by all parties and flow of humanitarian aid under UN supervision, a peacekeeping force in Palestine drawn largely from Arab nations and operating under the mandate of the UN security council, the immediate disarmament and demobilization of Hamas and other militias by the peacekeeping forces as part of the peace, um, uh, diplomatic relations established between Israel and all Arab states in conjunction with UN a membership in the state of Palestine. Well, that sounds good, but there's a few questions. I mean, how realistic? Again, I'm going to try and take the devil's advocate, yeah, sure, which sure. I may or may not agree with, but I just, it's worth questioning. In terms of, you know, nowhere is there a statement of guarantee of sort of Israeli security. And some people would argue that, that, it, I mean, some of the Israeli people would say we cannot stop fighting because the goal is to always destroy Israel. Um, and of course, that's clearly Hamas's goal. How can one be, if one did this, the big problem with this, some people might argue for a ceasefire, is that Hamas and others are going to try and use that to rearm and uh, and then attack Israel. And so what's your, so while this sounds, I, I, I agree, it's probably the only plausible long-term solution. Um, how can you ad address concerns about security and about the um, trustworthiness of, of such an agreement? Well, uh, first of all, uh, agreements uh, always need to be uh, implementable, monitorable, uh, and uh, no agreement is uh, is a uh, hundred percent secure. And by the way, there is no perfect security in this world or in this universe. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, is Israel doesn't uh, get perfect security when the rest of us uh, live under. Uh, insecurity of uh, many kinds. Everybody yeah. faces, uh, as I think it's the second law of thermodynamics, everybody faces insecurity. We all face uh, entropy. Uh, entropy. We all face, uh, yes, we, we all face uh, all of the uncertainties and uh, principles of degradation. You have to keep building uh, in order to keep order. So this is the first point. Uh, the second point is that this is a political process, mostly among 
uh, nation states, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, which is we need uh, the <coughs> major countries to operate responsibly under the UN Charter. Uh, and uh, that means Saudi Arabia needs to sign on, Iran needs to sign on, Egypt needs to sign on, Jordan needs to sign on, UAE needs to sign on, Qatar needs to sign on. Now, I talk to those diplomats all the time. They will sign on, actually. Iran they will, will sign, sign on? on. Iran has signed on repeatedly to what's called the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002 yeah. and to the uh, Arab Islamic Declaration in Riyadh in November 2023. Unfortunately, the New York Times doesn't carry these stories, by yeah. the way. So if you get yeah, your New news from the New York Times, you're not getting your news. Yeah, Listen wonder... to Lawrence Krauss instead. Uh, you'll get much better news. <laughs> <laughs> or Jeffrey Sachs is probably better. But anyway, um, yeah, no, okay. And one of the things you br bring out in that regard, and by the way, I should say in your writing, it's really the, the failure of journalism of late in the last bunch of mainstream journalism has really been a problem. But we again, we don't have time for that. But some people would argue that, and, and the hardliners in Israel argue, yeah, peace, but after we destroy Hamas. Hamas is a threat to the Israel, uh, Israeli uh, nation. And, we, and we'll first, so first destroy Hamas and kill everyone and then negotiate. Now, I, I will say that that's, that's kind of a policy that in general hasn't worked well. I mean, I was sympathetic to it because those people are crazy, but, but um, there's two points that, that um, one that you haven't raised, the one that occurred to me immediately is that that was the same argument that we sort of applied in Afghanistan and Iraq. And all it did was result in massive destruction and death of the population and never solved the problem. Iraq is a, is, and in Afghanistan never solved the problem to, to claim you're going to destroy the terrorists, then everything will, will go away. That's the first question. But the other thing you point out is that Hamas really has never had the capability of destroying the Israeli nation. In fact, destroy, killed very, killed very few people per year compared to to some extent, you would argue Israel uh, attacks on Palestine. So maybe you could comment on both those. Well, ju just on the second point, uh, the uh, UN data, which I trust, mm -hmm. uh, shows that uh, the civilian deaths from Palestinian attacks, civilian Israeli deaths, I should say, from Palestinian attacks averaged six per year between uh, 2007 and 2021. Now, six per year, you could say is sad, but unfortunately in my neighborhood uh, in New York, it's a, a greater number, no yeah. doubt. Uh, you know, we have shootings on both ends of our block, stabbings, other things. It's, uh, it, come on, real life, let's get real. Mm -hmm. uh, Hamas uh, does not have uh, an air force. Hamas does not have tanks. Hamas does not have uh, anything that truly threatens Israel. Uh, do I believe in uh, manning a border with the uh, Gaza? Yes, I do. Uh, do I think that Israel let its guard down on October 7? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, but does Hamas threaten uh, Israel? No. By the way, does Iran threaten Israel? Yes, uh, of course it does. Uh, we, we that's true of countries around, around the, world. the world. We're all threatened. We have nuclear armed countries. Yeah. Iran's not nuclear armed. It could be. It could at be some because point. we may let them. Yeah. There's no security in that way other than diplomacy. Yeah. The idea that you eradicate all your foes is some kind of uh, comic book description of uh, the world, in, which yeah, and is. Yeah, you which, know, which in fact, it does I, well, not exist. It does not exist. And one of the, your wonderful articles is diplomacy is the only way to solve the world problems. And it's sort of out of the, you point out there's diplomacy has disappeared when it comes to U.S. Russia relations, U.S. China relations. And, um, you know, I was just, uh, I was just actually listening and I'm going to have a podcast with someone who's involved in super communication who points out that negotiations, something that doesn't, certainly one of the people at least and maybe both people who are running for president don't seem to get that negotiations in the end have to be win-win they can't be win-lose that that you do, that you don't go to a negotiation to get what you want and the other person loses everything it never works 
It never works. You know, it's one of the great lines of uh, the uh, late uh, Shimon Peres, uh, mm -hmm. an Israeli leader, was uh, you, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. So you don't uh, negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your enemies. That's the whole point, you know, to, to find the mutual accommodation so that both sides survive. That's not so hard, but when you actually watch the diplomacy now, as I do hour by hour, the U.S. line is our friends and allies, our friends and allies. That's who we talk to, our friends and allies. No, I... uh, well, talk to the other side, damn it. Come yeah. on. Because well, let that's, me, let me, let, let me, uh, that's, that's where that's the all, issue that's, is. That's all sensible. And we, and again, I'm sorry to keep cutting in, but we don't have much time. Otherwise, I'd let you go on because, but the, but you have said something that, you know, people, you, you have used the word apartheid and genocide when you talk about Israel. And, and, and I know I've heard people like I, uh, Douglas Murray recently saying, you know, look, there's a war and Israel is, is not, the genocide is an interesting thing. Are you systematically trying to destroy a population? Um, and um, and the argument is that war. And it's certainly, for example, in the U.S. war in Iraq, for many, many more, what, half a million to a million people were killed versus 30,000. I never heard the term genocide applied yeah. there. Maybe it should have been, yeah. but it wasn't. What's the difference? Why, do you, why are you willing to use that word? Well, the, the difference is it's it's not just me, by the way. There's yeah, a, yeah, a, a yeah, case I, before the International Court of Justice uh, brought by uh, uh, South Africa. And the uh, long part of uh, the brief of South Africa, which people can find online, is uh, the intent. Because under the 1948 uh, Genocide Convention, the question of intent uh, is crucial. And... Is Israeli leaders uh, like uh, Bezalel Smotrich uh, mm -hmm. or Itamar Ben Gavir, who are two cabinet ministers of uh, great importance uh, in uh, the current uh, government of uh, Netanyahu, are so vulgar in their statements uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in what they've said that you look at it and say, oh my God, the intent is there. Now, shame on them. I think when they speak Hebrew, to their followers, they don't think anyone's listening. But in this day, everyone's got a, a mobile phone, everyone's mm -hmm. taping and posting everything. So we're hearing all of this stuff. We didn't hear uh, in Iraq uh, statements uh, by the US as much as I hated that war. So don't get me yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, I thought that war was so stupid, misguided no, and on phony print. But actually, Cheney did not say, as far as I know, we need to kill every one of those Iraqis or we need to push the Iraqis out, out of Iraq. Uh, you know, or Iraq is ours given to us by God. Uh, no, no, he might have said the latter. I'm not sure. But, uh, but. I know he may, have said the, he may have said the oil was ours. I don't think he said it was given to us by God. But uh, in any event, uh, he did not say the things that the Israeli leaders, I think, not realizing the whole world is listening uh, have said to their followers. So this is the intent question. But you know, the question is on the, the troops on the ground are not, are they intent, are they intentionally murdering and killing uh, Palestinians? So the, the leaders are, are nuts. A lot of them uh, w will agree with that. Yeah. Um, the leaders and, have sent, and, and the, the leaders have sent the, the soldiers of, in. In the, in the recent times, when seeing the public in, in Israel finally, or maybe not finally, but effectively mobilizing against their leaders, right? Yeah, the, the leaders have sent the uh, Israeli Defense Forces uh, into Gaza and have given uh, an assignment and mission which is horrific and I believe in violation of the 1948 Genocide Convention. For example, the uh, starvation Mm -hmm. of hundreds of thousands of people uh, is not uh, a rhetorical flourish. It's an immediate reality. Okay, you don't starve hundreds of thousands of people. You don't yeah. uh, under any circumstances, any form of war and not uh, be uh, subject to the genocide convention. So uh, the, the leaders are giving orders uh, and the leaders need to change their orders. 
And right now, I believe that Israel is extremely vulnerable. I think likely uh, it will uh, be uh, found in violation of the Genocide Convention. In fact, yeah, one of the things we don't have time for is you basically said one of your articles is saving Israel by ending its war in, uh, uh, in Gaza. It's the only way to save Israel, you think, is ultimately ending that. And 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 I hope that's the case. But the, that allows me a segment. I mean, in, in 10 minutes, I want to talk. It's not a fair. I want to talk about two things you meant. One is the other. The other boiling brew is 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 Ukraine. Yeah, and 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 then the other thing is a, one a remarkable a remarkable piece by you on U.S. foreign policy is a scam built on corruption. Mm -hmm. L let's go to Ukraine, and then let's go to foreign policy in general and the corruption of the of. Uh, uh, also, you talk about the CIA, and it's in there are facts in there that are remarkable and damning. It's really really um, really compelling reading, and I recommend people oh. read it. But um, look, one of the things you said about Ukraine is something that, again I, I, we've I actually posted one of your pieces on my Substack site, because it seems to me so eminently reasonable and I can't understand why people don't recognize there's no way to win. the. There's no way that Ukraine is going to defeat Russia in the sense of, def I mean, there's no way that war is going to end. It's That's just going to keep going and going unless there are some discussions. But you do point out two things. One, which a lot of people, of course, disagree with, but a lot of it, that, that Russia was provoked, at least by the U.S. reneging on its agreements regarding NATO, which it clearly did. And the other two and three things, which I think are worth raising in the public's recognition, reneging on a NATO, um, the, um, uh, the, the overthrow, the, the, the coup in 2014, uh, and the U.S. efforts to sabotage agreements that would have produced a diplomatic end to the war. So why don't you spend four or five minutes talking about that? Yeah, I think the, the, the main thing, and I, it, all of these points are related, uh, the CIA, uh, the U.S. foreign policy, and Ukraine. Uh, if people want to understand this uh, war, just read one article. Read Zbigniew Brzezinski's article in Foreign Affairs in 1997 uh, called the Eurasia Strategy. Brzezinski, of course, was a very senior uh, international strategist for the U.S. and Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. Very clever. Uh, I liked him very much uh, personally, and he uh, helped very much uh, on Poland's, uh, uh, Poland's uh, transformation. So I appreciated him very much. Very smart, by the way. But his view was uh, we need to corner Russia uh, and weaken Russia and make Russia a second rate or third rate uh, power or Russia maybe will fall apart like the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, and uh, I think it was uh, Brzezinski's uh, Polish fervor also uh, with its uh, anti-Russian uh, history that uh, uh, helped uh, animate those views. But 1997, he spelled it all out. NATO is going to expand. Uh, NATO uh, is going to uh, expand uh, into the Black Sea. Uh, without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a great power. Uh, and um, he spelled that out also in a book called The Global Chessboard the same year. Um, this is it. Uh, this has been playing out now for a quarter century. And for Russia, well, that's an existential threat. It, it would be like uh, China declaring uh, some clever Chinese uh, analyst saying, well, uh, China needs to contain the US, which is obviously uh, anti-China. So we're going to put bases uh, in Mexico, uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, the Bahamas, uh, 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 throughout the Caribbean region, uh, Canada, and so forth. And we'll tell the U.S. we're peace loving uh, <laughs> and not to worry about it. But that's what we're going to do uh, now. That's what we did vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Russia said, no, uh, please don't do that. Don't surround <laughs> us. We don't want you all over our territory. Uh, and um, they kept saying that. And uh, the Europeans, I know because they told me, he said, 
you know, your, your guy, George W. Bush, yeah, he's a little out of control. Uh, we don't need this NATO push in 2008 to Ukraine. This is going to, this is going to go badly. Someone today sent me uh, a, uh, from a, uh, an advisor of uh, Jacques Chirac, uh, some advice to Chirac in 19, in 2006, I think it is, uh, where Chirac says, you know, we, we don't really want a war with Russia over this. So we walked into this. We thought we could do this without Russia objecting, or if they objected, so what? Uh, or if they uh, actually tried to resist, we would always win. We're the United States. We're the greatest power in the world. Russia's a pipsqueak. Russia's a, a gas station with nuclear weapons, as the mm -hmm. phrase went. And basically, we walked into this. And for Russia, this was an existential threat. We don't want to be surrounded by the United States. And by the way, it wasn't just Ukraine. It's also the country of Georgia. Look at a map. How the hell could anyone say that that's a North Atlantic country yeah. or that's a country that's going to shape the security of the North Atlantic mm -hmm. states? That is a country that happens to be on the eastern border of the Black Sea, yeah. part of America's idea of surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And note, one of the reasons why the Black Sea counts so much is that Russia has had its naval fleet in Sevastopol since 1783. Yeah. And so the Black Sea is not just some incidental beachfront uh, for <laughs> Russia. It's absolutely fundamental. We walked into this when the Ukraine government said, mm, maybe this is, we don't want this. This is going to get us into a mess. We overthrew that government in 2014. Something is Victor very important. And, and people, you never hear about that. And, and, and of you course, you out. don't hear about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, all of this has a history of recklessness, of, uh, uh, of uh, upping the ante, of playing a weak hand. And the hand is weak for a reason that Obama did recognize, and I give him credit for this. He recognized back in 2015, he used the expression actually, or an expression like it, escalatory dominance, that they could keep raising the stakes up to nuclear war. And in the end, we can't trump that. For us, it's a, you know this is a, a good geopolitical play. If we get away with it and get NATO there, great, it's great, but it's not existential for us. The US doesn't depend mm -hmm. on Ukraine being in NATO or the US having bases there, but for Russia, it's existential. And Obama realized, well, they've got nukes. They're gonna, they're gonna play their existential hand, where for us, it's a matter of convenience. I think most of the American strategists are, are stupid, by the way. I, I mean it in, in an intellectual sense. They don't think ahead. I'm, by the way, extremely unimpressed with most of our generals. Of course, I'm not talking about their military insights. I'm talking about their diplomatic mm -hmm. ideas because generals don't, it, their job is not diplomacy. Yeah. Their job is to fight a battle. Maybe they know something about that, so though sometimes you wonder. But when you put generals out in front of our policies, policies, this is a absolutely wrong-headed approach. It's we, we not have as their a general, job. We have a general as a, as, a, as a member of the cabinet right now. Yeah, as a, it's not their job. They don't get this stuff. Their their job is weapons procurement or some strategy on a battlefield. What, why don't, look, okay, why don't you just one one minute talk about that? You, you talk, mentioned 2014, but I think it's important people to know that, that there was willingness to have a diplomatic solution early on in the, uh, in the conflict with Ukraine, and, sorry, the way, which the U.S. scuttled. Ru Russia wanted to have diplomacy for 30 years. That yeah. I know for sure. Mm -hmm. I know it firsthand for sure. And we always said, no, we're the United States. We don't need to talk with you. Yeah, this is the basic idea. And then when Russia and Ukraine actually negotiated an end to the war two months after it started in Ankara, Turkey, with Turkish mediation, the U.S. stopped it. Give me a break. I'm telling you, they're not clever, these people. 
They're playing a lousy hand the wrong way. They keep raising the stakes. It's obvious that this isn't going to work. I've written about it for years that it's just going to fail. Aside from whatever ones it's hard. views whether, whether, are, whether it's going to, yeah, I mean, it, how it's going to fail is unusual. But the, but just looking at this, uh, saying how could it, how could the this, how could this conflict ever end except for diplomacy? I yes. cannot, it just seems impossible. This statement that we got to keep arming, we got to fight. All it does is kill more people, and in the end, it's going to. If it's going to end in any other way than than Armageddon. It's got to end by people talking. I mean, I just don't see if you still that, if you asked a if you asked a six year old, in fact, Chomsky would say to me, if you ask a five year old something, it, it's obvious to them. Then it probably is true, and it and it's you know and 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 uh, and, it, and well, but that, it's amazing how our leaders, do, you know, how we hear the opposite when you know. I, I sometimes say, and I'm always corrected by my wife when I say it, I say they act like children. And my wife says, no, the children act better <laughs> uh, because because these people are operating on a news cycle and spin. They are not thinking what is the what is what we call it a sub game perfection in game theory. How's this yeah. going to play out? We talk. You talk about game theory, and I wish we had time to talk about that because that negotiation is is a big is 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 a big question of game theory and how and how to how to when no one can win how to how to ultimately have a game end effectively. Uh, well, one one thing I'll say about game theory that I think is, is scientifically interesting and valid: most game theory, what's called non-cooperative game theory, yeah. is you don't talk to the other side in game theory. Yeah, there is no communication. Yeah. And the famous prisoner's dilemma, uh, where you show that the two sides end up in a non-cooperative mode, even though cooperation would be better for them, is this uh, formalization where the story is that the prisoners are locked by their interrogators in separate rooms okay. so that okay. they're not allowed to communicate. But in our world, I keep saying to the White House, Damn it, use my Zoom if you want, but call Putin. <laughs> you know, don't think you're locked in a separate room because yeah, we can exact. talk with each other. The one cooperative games actually only, you're right, only work without communication and the communication to phase of that. L let me end with a question related to one of your U.S. policies, scam belt and corruption, something that would amaze me. U.S. military linked outlays in 2024 will come to around $1.5 trillion or roughly $12,000 per household. Ultimately, the, the argument there, which is which is is not new, is that foreign policy is really not being based on logic or altruism, as often said, or even even necessarily self in, effective self interest of the country. It's based on self interest of people who are making a lot of money. At, 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 so, Ukraine, there is a rational argument for sending weapons to Ukraine if the people controlling that um, discussion of the people who are making money by the sale of weapons coming back to something in Eisenhower, you know, was the, I think he was the first person to, talk, yes. to use the word military industrial complex. It's not 1961 new. 1961 farewell address. Yeah. And, and so are we seeing, uh, is that at the root of this problem ultimately? Yes. I, our problem started in 1947 with the National Security Act, which turned the U.S. into a security state. Uh, meaning that it is a state dominated by uh, security considerations, the military, secrecy, the CIA as an operative uh, secret army, uh, and uh, yep. what happened over time, uh, a network of 800 overseas military bases in 80 countries 80 countries you know you've you've got a lot of uh, a lot of hardware all over the world you've got uh, a lot of uh, military personnel all over the world this is a huge lucrative enterprise uh, and it is uh, you know it's it's about a trillion dollars in direct military pentagon outlays and you add in the CIA, you add in uh, Homeland Security, you add in veterans costs, which are enormous. Uh, that's uh, you, if, if you want, uh, you can uh, attribute a piece of the debt to all of these wars and the debt service, uh, a trillion to a trillion and a half dollars, 1.5 trillion is a reasonable 
uh, expression of this, boy, that's a hell of a lot of money. Uh, and uh, it's and it it's it funds so many university uh, institutes. It funds yeah. uh, so many think tanks. Uh, it funds so many individual. It uh, advertises so much uh, in the mainstream media. This is America's big business. It's not the only it's one. A racket, as we, you point out. Yeah, it's a racket. It's 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 a racket, and uh, we got a lot of spokesmen for it, uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, as I say, the universities are deeply implicated, unfortunately, because they got a lot of money from this. Yeah. Uh, and you look at uh, where we get our information. Check out the donor box. Uh, check out uh, your donors uh, in Congress uh, on OpenSecrets.org. And you can uh, begin to see how this racket works. Well, look, I, you know, we've touched on the surface of so many things. I, I hope we can do this again sometime. We are going to generate, this is going to generate a lot of discussion. And I'm sure, Good. I'm, I'm sure hate mail for me, but, 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 but um, these are discussions that need to happen. And, and I have to say, you know, it, it, I, I, we've only been able to scratch the surface and I, I hope I haven't been able to maybe maybe i have illuminate a little bit your intellectual depth and breadth uh, i will tell people for if you really want to understand how amazing the intellect of jeffrey Sachs is teach him physics and discover <laughs> how you wish he was one of your students because i've been there and um and Jeff, jeffrey I, nice. I really mean i you know there are few people that inspire me intellectually as much as you in terms of your incredible interest and enthusiasm at questioning and it's a it's an inspiration and and i um well, I feel the same way about you, and we're going to continue the discussion. Okay, and good Absolutely. luck to you. Good luck, and thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day. I mean, I have nothing to do today except maybe fix a dock, but you, you have to go help the world, so you go do that. And um, and thanks for taking a little bit of time and discussing some topics with me. It's been really a, great to be with you. Okay, thanks so thanks much. Again. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.